Good morning. We're going to be in Acts 15 this morning, so go ahead and open your Bibles up to Acts 15. We're going to be looking at a story from the early church as we consider what the church is and what we're doing as a church and how we are accomplishing what God wants us to do for his kingdom, for this world, for his glory. So I just want to thank you, Kyle, and, and the team for just leading us this morning and just singing that, that wonderful song. And I just want to add to that, if you are not resting in Jesus this morning, uh, don't leave this place until you find the confidence that you can indeed rest in our Savior. When we're talking about issues of the church, which can seem secondary to that, but everything that we are discussing about the nature of the church, the purpose of the church, today the governance of the church, is built upon the reality that Jesus Christ has saved us from sin and death. That's the gospel message. That's why we gather here together. But God has done more, more than just give us a gospel message. He has given us a people that can gather together to not just take the gospel to the uttermost, but to care for one another as we are still struggling and laboring in this world. And some of you have been struggling and laboring this week. And the idea of peace and rest is elusive to you. And, and before we get deeper into this, I just want to say the nature of the gospel is that you have peace and rest in Jesus Christ. Be encouraged. We're not just talking about some fantasy, some storyline that, that makes us feel good. We're talking about the reality that God became flesh and dwelt among us because we're sinners and we can't come to faith in Jesus Christ. We can't come to salvation apart from that faith in Jesus Christ. And so we can rest in him because the perfect one, fully God and fully man, has become our salvation, our freedom. And so as we sing that wonderful song, we have assurance that Jesus Christ is alive. He has conquered death and he has paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. Amen. So we can rest in that. But he's given us a church. He hasn't just said, okay, go out and be saved. Be on your own. He says, you can't do this on your own. I know that because you're going to struggle. As you're struggling this week, I struggled this week, we've all struggled this week, and we need one another. And that's the beauty of this community called the church that God has given to us. It is a gift. Sometimes it doesn't feel like a gift. I, I recognize that. Sometimes you've been in some churches where you're like, those people, they're not really acting like Christ. The, they're giving Christ a, a bad name. And, and some of you have run from some of those churches, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that other Christians haven't come together to give you an image of what the church should be, an image of who Christ is. Because that's ultimately what we're doing here. And think about what the church is, is so that we can be structured in the right way so that we can magnify God in the, in the most beautiful way to the community around us. To say this is what's right and this is what's wrong. This is what's true and this is what's false. And so God has given us a church. As we look around, we can see one another. He's given us each other so that we can image that to one another and image that to the community around us. So we should want to know what the church is. We should want to be a part of the church. We should desire to, be, to gather together not to confess our sins to one another. We should desire to gather together to hear the word proclaimed, to hear that gospel message again. We should desire to gather together to take that gospel message to the community. We should desire to gather together, take care of this community, and take care of one another when we have needs. This is what the church does. We see this all throughout the book of Acts, all throughout the New Testament. The people of God in the new covenant acting for God's glory and for the kingdom. The church is an embassy of the kingdom as we're a part of that. So that means that we need to rightly think about what that church is. We've talked about this, and when, we, and when we looked at Matthew 28, looked at the purpose of the church. And we've seen that that purpose is to make disciples. It's part of who we are at First Mansfield. We are making disciples. We are structuring the things that we do towards that end because that's the end that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission. 
We then think about the church in its nature in a way that understands who we are as a body of Christ, as being united in Christ, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and living from that reality. So everything we do comes back once again to saying, is this imaging Christ? Is this full of the Holy Spirit? That's, that's our mindset when we think about what the church is. So last week we came together and we said, okay, so then who's a member of this church? Who can come into it? And so if you want to be a member of this church, you know that you have to be saved. You have to be baptized. And we're going to hold you accountable to walking the walk that the Bible shows us of what a Christian should be. And we should want to hold each other accountable toward that end. Listen, accountability is a good thing. Some of us run from it. We don't like accountability because we don't like discipline. But health is also a good thing. So we should run towards health. We should run towards being whole. And so we should do these in the biblical ways that God has given us because he understands all things because he created all things. And what he says is healthy, what, he, what we find in the Bible, that's what we want to follow. We don't want to be unhealthy. And so that's what we're seeking after this morning. And part of it is, is understanding authority. So when we talk about church governance, and that's the topic we have today, as we've seen in Acts 15, it, it may sound like, okay, that just sounds really academic. It sounds like this is not this like full-on gospel message, but let me tie this together for you. When we think rightly about authority and about governance and how we organize one another in the authority structure God has given us, it helps us be a healthy church. And the healthier church that we have, the more we can do the mission that's out there. An unhealthy church doesn't lead to healthy mission. This is the vehicle God has given to take the mission to the uttermost, so we want to make sure that we're being as healthy as possible. Does that follow? I said that last week. I want to keep saying that. That's why we want to talk about this. It has grave effects for what we do. You want to reach the world for Christ? You need a strong church. You want to be a light to the community around us? You need a strong church. That that's why we want to pay attention to that. And part of it is how we govern one another. And, and there are more biblical ways to govern than, than not. And so Baptists have a very particular way we talk about governance. But before we get into that, I really want us to understand what authority is. Because some of us kick against authority individually in our lives. Jesus is telling you through the word, through your life, to do certain things. And you say, I don't really want to do that. If you are a follower of Christ, the things of Christ are not optional. Let that sink in. We don't get to choose which things we follow from the Lord. It's very clear in Scripture of how a Christian lives out his life. Culture says, do otherwise. Those things don't matter. There are weak Christians throughout history have come out and said, yeah, the Bible's not really true on that. But here at First Mansfield, we believe in the authority and the infallibility of the inspired word of God. Sometimes when I read it, it reads me, and I don't like it because it means I have to change. And maybe that's you too. But we need to conform ourselves to the Word of God because this is the truth in a world that's all consumed with falsehood. So we want to follow after that, but we have to submit ourselves to its authority. And, and in fact, the idea of authority, for some people it says, like, I don't like talking about this. It always seems like you know, you're trying to have some more power over me. And as individuals in the 21st century, uh, in the postmodern world, use that big term that we get out there sometimes, is that we like to just think about ourselves against everyone else. I define my own identity. I define who I am, and no one else can tell me who I am. That's the world we live in, right? A confused world. And we're becoming more and more confused because we don't understand authority. And sometimes we don't like authority because we look at the politics around us like, I don't like what that politician's doing. I don't like what that party's doing out there. Uh, I, I really want to, like, push back against that. But we have to recognize that all authority comes from one place. It comes from God himself. Romans 13 is clear on this. When, when the, the people who are Christians in Rome in a world that was anti-Christian are being told, submit to the authorities that are above you. Pay taxes. Understand that they don't bear the sword in, in vain. That it's for your good. And, and, and notice this, all authority comes from one place. No one has been put in authority unless the one who has authority has put them there. 
That, that's a difficult thing to do because we recognize that those in authority sometimes fail, but we have a sovereign and a good Lord that's over all the creation. We have to trust in that truth, that God is good and God is in control. And, and authority is a good thing that he's given to us. Jesus himself, and, and we can read this in John 19, Jesus himself is, is talking uh, to those who are questioning him, and he says, you only have authority because it's been given to you. So, so twice in these two instances we understand authority comes from God to us. And we want to submit to that authority. Because when we don't submit to God's authority, what happens? Things don't go well. It's the same thing in, in your household. Kids, your parents tell you, here are the rules. You don't follow the rules. What happens? Things don't go well, right? Parents, the government says, here's the rules. You don't follow them. What happened? Things don't go well. It's as simple as that. Authority is for our good. Sometimes we think the rules aren't, aren't great. Sometimes the rules need to change. We live in a democracy. We have the ability to come in and, and work towards those rules. We, we're not saying that all authority is perfect all the time, and we're not saying those in authority don't sin. I'm not, don't hear me wrong there, but authority itself is a good thing because it comes from a good God. So when we think about the nature of the church, we want to have an authority with that. And when we don't submit to authority, it is a theological problem. Sometimes we think in our mind, it's that person I don't want to submit to, my boss, the pastor of this church, the president of the United States. I don't want to submit to that authority, but it's a theological one if we understand that authority is derived. Ultimately, we're saying, I don't want to submit to God. And so we have to, in our hearts, ask ourselves, am I just kicking against the goads? Or am I really trying to follow through with principles? So sometimes we have to tell those in power, like, hey, this is wrong. Let's find better rules here. But we don't jettison authority in that process. We want to look at proper authority. Now, some of you may be, may be cynical about this, too. Like, oh, no, I come to church. I, I hear a pastor start preaching about certain things. They talk about tithing. And, and they're like, okay, they just want to get more money from me, right? The, and, and they talk about something like authority in the church. They just want to have power over me, Right? And maybe I don't want to submit to that. The youth minister comes up, starts talking about, you know, a, a car wash. And he's like, and you, you want me to be clean now. I was like, I see the problem here. No, don't be cynical uh, when we look at anything around us. And that, that last example is just ludicrous. But sometimes that's how we're at. No one tells me what to do. If that's your attitude, you need to repent of that and rest in the peace of King Jesus. Right. That he has good authority over you. And he's given us the church, and we need to submit to the type of authority you have for the church. So what we have here in Acts 15 is an example of authority. So, so read with me in Acts 15. We'll begin in the first verse. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about the issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, said to them brothers and sisters, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly 
became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written, After these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again. So the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the eating things that have been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. And we'll stop there. You can read on with this story. But what I want us to notice here is in particular not, not really the content of what is that issue here. There's a decision that's being made. But how that decision is being made. And that's what I want us to focus on with this passage. How, how do they come to make this decision? How do they work together to lead to the truth that they, they ran up against? But I do think it's important to kind of address what's going on here to give us some context. Here in the book of Acts, we're, we're coming uh, after a process of uh, the, the Holy Spirit has come down in Acts chapter 2. The church has been born, and, and now people are building the church in Jerusalem, and then persecution happens, and they scatter. And we already read this in Acts chapter 1, where uh, Jesus tells them, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost, right? And, and that's kind of like a table of contents for the book of Acts itself. Because we see here how the gospel message comes to Jerusalem, then goes to Samaria, then to Judea, and then to the uttermost. As we especially see what Paul does as he takes it across the, the Roman Empire. And, and the gospel is going forth. Churches are coming forth. Well, in that process, uh, they go out from Jerusalem and Judea into Samaria. And we, we know from reading elsewhere in the Bible, the Samaritans and the Jews related somewhat, but have a slightly different understanding of truth. Jesus himself says, uh, is talking to his Samaritans, well, and she says, you, you say we should worship in Jerusalem. We say we should worship on this mountain. And Jesus says, there's a day coming while you will neither worship on either, but worship in spirit and truth. Prophesying a time of what the church would be. And so uh, in Acts, they, they have this sense of saying, like, can Samaritans come to faith? Well, what's the evidence that they've come to faith? They, too, have had a Pentecostal experience and received the Spirit. Meaning, they look like true believers because they are, have the same Spirit that we believers have. So we recognize them as true believers. And so this is why it's important that when we think about church membership, we make sure that someone actually is a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what's at, what is at stake here. Well, then it goes out further to the Gentiles. And Peter has this vision uh, th uh, this dream that God has given him about take up and eat. And in this, in this sense, there's like, I don't eat those things because I'm a Jew. And God says, what I want you to do, you do. And in, in that sense, they start recognizing the Gentiles who are not Jews are coming to faith as well. Well, for those who have been in a Jewish household their whole lives, and have been taught the scriptures their whole lives, and want to follow the law that we find in, in the Old Testament, this is different, that someone can come to faith and not have to do those things. This caused a good bit of tension in the early church. Do you have to become a Jew before you become a Christian? And what they see is that the Spirit is coming to those who are not circumcised. Remember, this is the sign of the covenant of the people of God in the Old Testament. If you are a, a Jew, you will be circumcised. So what they're saying here is like, well, if these Gentiles are getting saved, they have to first be circumcised. They have to follow the law of the Old Testament, which is very important because remember the Jewish people, uh, they got in trouble for not following the law. If, if you read the Old Testament over and over and over again, they're like, okay, we're going to ultimately send you into exile to 70 years in Babylon until you can come back. 
So they come back, like, we want to take the Bible seriously because God is very serious about following what he says. They get authority, they just add things to it. And this is what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. He has to come along and say, like, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Six times he does this in Matthew 5 about how the Pharisees and others have added more laws to the law. And so what Jesus is trying to do is kind of like get to what God really wants us to see. Well, what he wants us to see is that he is the fulfillment of that Old Testament law. He is the fulfillment of what we, we call the Mosaic Covenant. The law that Moses gave and the covenant that Moses made with the people of God in the Old Testament, Jesus has fulfilled that. And that's what they're, they're talking about here. It's like it's a yoke that these Gentiles can't bear. And by the way, it's a yoke we can't bear. Because that's the, that's the reality why Jesus had to come. God gives us the law and says, this is how you have to live. This is what righteousness looks like. You have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, as he says in Matthew chapter 5. Well, who can do that? Who can be perfect? And the reality is no one can. That's why Jesus had to come. Jesus had to come so that he could be that perfect human and offer that perfect sacrifice because we can't do it. You are so simple, you are not capable of doing this, but God sent his son. And so when we, when we read about the Lord's Supper, we're going to find what Jesus does. He says, this is the new covenant I have with you. The old covenant is fulfilled in me. It doesn't go away. It's fulfilled. And I, and I start the new covenant. Jeremiah prophesied about that. You want to know more about that? Read Hebrews of how all this comes together. That's what the new covenant is. And, and as new covenant Christians, we have this reality, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, that those who have faith in Jesus Christ have the freedom of the new covenant, the freedom in Jesus Christ. You can be saved because Jesus has come. You don't have to become a Jew first. That's what they're talking about. And what is the evidence that someone really is saved? The reception of the Holy Spirit. How do you know that you're a believer? You have the Holy Spirit. This means that you think differently than you used to. You're convicted of sin when you weren't before. These are some of these realities, what it looks like to actually be saved. If you question that, do I have the Holy Spirit? Maybe you should come talk to me. Go to the next step area and talk to someone after the service and say, like, am I truly a Christian? We don't want you to leave this building today until you are confident in that. I'm going to say that every time I'm up here. Spencer's going to say that. We want to make sure that you know Jesus Christ. Yes, we want you to serve. Yes, we want you in a life group. We want all these things. But if you don't know Jesus, all those things are for naught. We want to make sure that you know Jesus. But when you do know Jesus... We want you to walk the walk that God has for us. And that comes into the way in which we think about how decisions are made, how governance comes together. And so here you have people saying, you have to be circumcised. And you have others saying, no, you don't have to. Well, who's right? How do we make a decision here? And so that's what I want us to pay attention to uh, on church governance. How do, we, how do we look and make decisions about what we do inside churches? Not just about these issues, which seem to be settled for us, but what about other issues that come before the church? Who's in control? Who makes decisions? And, and that's what we want to look at here. So notice in particular, when you're walking through this text, that there are three, three groups of people that are utilized in making decisions here. First, you have the apostles. So they have the issue of circumcision and, and Christians at play here. Who are we going to talk to? Well, let's go see the apostles. Well, who are the apostles? In short, the apostles are those gifted with the spiritual gift of apostleship. So not just anyone can call themselves apostles. Apostles are those, as we can read in Acts chapter 1, who have been with us from the beginning and have seen the resurrected Christ. And so today you may come across people who say, I have the gift of apostleship. Uh, and I would say, have you seen the resurrected Christ? And I would think, you don't have that gift. That gift has ceased. But these same apostles are the ones who give us the New Testament. They're the ones who are inspired by the Spirit, who are the teachers, who are giving us uh, these letters and these Gospels and, and the, the Scriptures that we are going to submit ourselves to. So they have great authority. Paul, Peter, etc. Uh, the, these people are the ones that we listen to because they are apostles. Secondly, you have the elders here that, that you find. So the apostles, the elders. So who are these elders? These elders are the leaders in the church. 
We're going to have a sermon in a couple of weeks talking about what elders and pastors are, what leaders are in the church. But in short, these elders are the ones that are leading these local churches. They're, they're the ones that uh, aren't apostles. Some of them could be apostles, but these are the ones that are particularly in, 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 in leadership here as they're distinct from the apostles. So you have these two important teachers. We, we look back at Acts chapter 6 that the diaconate, the deacons are created, and deacons are servants of the church so that the leaders of the church can do what they're supposed to do, teach. So the elders are the ones that are teaching. So you have this decision to be made here. It's a theological issue. Do we have to be circumcised before we become a member of a church? Well, let's go to the teachers. And who are the main teachers? The apostles who have been spiritually gifted in ways that you and I are not. And these elders who are gifted in some ways that some of you are. But it's not just those two groups that are making decisions here. No, notice, all throughout this passage is that the church is involved. It's actually the church in Antioch that sends them to Jerusalem. There's an authority that comes from the entire body here. And then when we get down to uh, verse 22 in particular, they're, they're done with all these discussions. Then, then we have this. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men. So this third group is the whole church. It's the assembly. It's, it's everyone together. And so the governance that is occurring in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 is a governance that includes apostles, elders, and the whole church. It's not the sense that there's this committee of, of, of men that get together and make decisions and say, okay, you guys do this. There's wisdom that comes from that committee that obviously occurs here. Uh, uh, verse 6 shows that it's just the apostles and elders gathering to consider it. But ultimately, when the decision is made, the whole church has to be in agreement with it. And so this is just an example of how we think about what church governance should look like. And so how, is, how have Baptists looked at this? How does First Mansfield look at governance? That's what I want to kind of unpack a little bit. Uh, for the rest of our time together. When we look at other churches out there, we, we run across those who have different ideas of what church governance could look like. Uh, and if you come from different traditions, you may have experienced some of this. Uh, some of these ideas are built upon biblical concepts like who a bishop is the, or who an elder is in a church. And, and they have varieties of ways of doing church governance that they think is following the Bible. In fact, a lot of them look at Acts 15. But they don't see that the whole church is involved in that process. Uh, one group together, maybe you've heard of uh, the Episcopalian church. They're called that because of their church governance. And what that means is that there's a hierarchy to this style of church governance where one person at the top is in control and there's a hierarchy of those who follow that one person's leadership. A good example would be the Roman Catholic Church, right? That the Pope is, is up at the top of that and then there's a hierarchy that flows out of that. You can find this in other types of churches that, are, that aren't as expansive as the Roman Catholic Church, but like the Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Um, you can find this in the Anglican Church uh, as well, th these type of top-down uh, works. Evangelicals often do this. We have a lot of churches that have a, a structure that puts a, the pastor at the top and then and comes down uh, with other pastors and other pastors that are underneath them. There's a hierarchy that's there where the decision-making ultimately goes up to one person. So that, that's where I want us to understand that form of governance says decision-making goes to one person. Another form uh, is something called Presbyterianism. Now, we, we know that there's a Presbyterian churches out there, but this is connected to the, the biblical concept of the elder, or the word is the presbyter, or presbyteros in Greek, for those of you who want to be a Greek nerds. And it, it points to kind of a board of elders that are making decisions, that are ruling. And, and in some of these churches, like Presbyterian churches, they have ruling elders. It doesn't mean they don't listen to the church, but the church itself doesn't have the ultimate authority to make decisions. The, the main ultimate decision making that occurs in these churches is with this oligarchy. So there's a hierarchy there that leads to an oligarchy. Sometimes that, that's over one church. Sometimes it's over multiple churches, depending upon the system that's there. Th those are two different forms of church governance you may have run across. And Baptists have rejected both of those from our beginning. Now, sometimes we may slip into one of the other two. But by 
uh, by our confession, throughout history, Baptists have been what we call congregational, congregationalists. And what that means, like we see here in Acts 15, that the decision-making of the church is by the whole church, by the whole congregation, congregationalism. Okay, that's take off my, my professor hat for a second here. That, those are the categories that we have. And so why, why would we want to articulate congregationalism? Because I think we see it here in Acts 15. Because I think we see it in how we think about the body of Christ. That we recognize that we are a body. Some of you have giftings that I don't have, that Spencer doesn't have, that, that the staff doesn't have. And that we, we need one another as we gather together. And this is why we spent all the time talking about the nature of the church and church membership. It comes back to that. It flows out of that. That we are a congregation together. So our governance needs to recognize that together. So I want to give you kind of a simple understanding of what congregationalism is, of, of what we want to assert as our type of governance here at First Mansfield. And as I do this, I want you to think about each one of these elements as it affects the gospel. As it affects the reality of you being saved and doing the work that God's called you to do in a church for God's glory and God's kingdom. So simply stated, uh, I'm going to give you four different concepts of how we can think about uh, our governance. And these are hierarchical of, of how we want to think about them. They're really simple statements that the, the person or the group that's talked about is important and the function the verb that's there is important as well. So I want you to write these down and pay close attention to them. So first and foremost, when we talk about church governance, we want to understand that we are ruled by Jesus. Ruled by Jesus. Now I'm choosing that term rule very carefully because we're not going to use this in the other parts of church governance. There's only one ruler of our church, and that's King Jesus. He is our sovereign we submit to him. So when we talk about the nature of the church and the purpose of the church, looking back at Matthew 28, when we get the Great Commission, we understand we're receiving it because all authority has been given to Jesus, and I am with you even to the end of the age, that uh, power and that presence of Jesus is with us, is with the local church. We submit to Jesus in everything. You individually have to submit to him daily in your lives. We as a church have to submit to Jesus daily. This means that any sense of a, the church governing or leaders leading in our church has to submit themselves to who Jesus is. And how do we know what Jesus wants? Well, he has given us his word. So here at First Baptist Mansfield, we hold, hold the word of God high. We submit ourselves to it. Culture pushes against this. So we say we're not going to follow culture. We're going to follow the word of God. Now, sometimes that might, might think, well, you talked about authority earlier. What do we do there? Well, a good example is John chapter 4. I'm not John. Acts chapter 4. We have Peter and John that are being brought into prison for speaking in the name of Jesus. And they are told, well, we want you to cease and desist speaking in the name of Jesus. And they say, listen, leaders, do to us whatever you must. There's a submission to authority. But here's also submission to higher authority. But we cannot stop speaking in the name of Jesus. So in an American sense, we want to, you know, d democratically have our way and say, like, when an authority tells us not to do something, well, what we do is like, well, then you're just not a real authority. Here in Acts chapter 4, we find them saying, yeah, we're not questioning your authority. We're just saying we're appealing to a higher authority. And that means that we may have to go through persecution. And the culture that's coming at us, we're going through persecution in a greater and greater degree as our understanding of how we walk and live our lives is different than the secular understanding out there. And listen, friends, the way forward is to submit ourselves to the word of God. Submit ourselves to King Jesus. We have to want to do that. When we don't submit ourselves to the word, when we don't submit ourselves to Jesus, we run awry. You know that person in your life, like I haven't been following Jesus lately, and my life's a wreck. But as we sang earlier, when we rest in Jesus, we find peace. And we can have joy even in the midst of turmoil. We can find joy there. Because we believe in who Jesus is as our sovereign. And we believe that God is indeed good. 
That's our theology. That's our belief statement. That's, that's who we believe God is. So we as a church, we submit ourselves to that. We submit to scripture. We are ruled by Jesus Christ in every way. Secondly, we are governed by the congregation. How is governing different than ruling? Really, I just want to have in mind your decision making. We don't have a decision making like others do, saying it's one person at the top that makes all the decisions. We don't have a board that's making all the decisions. Congregationalism means that we are saying the congregation is the one who makes the decision. Underneath the ruling of Jesus Christ, through his word, but the congregation makes the ultimate decisions. And so we see that throughout Acts 15, that the whole church is a part of that. You are a part of that. That's what we're saying congregationalism is, is that if you are a member of this church, you are part of the governing of this church. So when we pick leaders, when we vote on budget, when, when we talk about wh what we're going to do um, with, with missions into the community, that we want the whole church to be part of that. When we bring in members, we want the whole congregation to be a part of that process. When we have to exclude members, as we talked about last week, the congregation needs to be a part of that. That's what it says there in Matthew 18. Tell it to the church. Congregational. Baptists have hold, held on to this from the beginning. We are not moving away from that here at First Mansfield. We are going to be congregational, meaning that we are governed by the church. We're going to do that imperfectly as, as we look at the Bible sometimes, but together we can do this well. So we want to make sure that we're ruled by Jesus and governed by the congregation. Third, that we're led by pastors and elders. That we're led by by pastors and elders. Now, we're going to have a whole sermon talking about what pastors are and what deacons are. Uh, and so, in, in, in a sense here, pastors and elders, we're using them synonymously. You can find this throughout the Bible that we believe that the term pastor or elder or overseer are all interchangeable terms for the leaders of a church. Some other traditions get caught up on trying to create these as different offices. We see them as one office. So it's really simple. Spencer is our pastor. Spencer is our elder. That's how I'm thinking about it. That's how I think you should think about it because I think that is how the Bible thinks about it. So, so don't get caught up on that term elder there, but it is a biblical term of talking about how there's leadership that's going on here. Notice that pastor or elder is not governing the church. The church governs. That pastor or the elder is not ruling the church. Jesus is ruling the church. That pastor and elder or pastors and elders, are leading the church. Now, just as the whole congregation has a derived authority from Jesus who has ultimate authority, so too do the pastors and elders have a derived authority. It's a twofold derived authority because we believe that God calls out leadership in our church, so they have an authority that's derived directly from Jesus Christ, but they also have an authority because the church is the one who puts them in this position that's derived from the church as well, as the congregation decides who these people are. They don't get to determine who's going to be the leaders apart from the congregation because the congregation is the one who is governing. But they also lead from a position of authority that is given to them by the word of God through King Jesus. And so we want to submit to that as they are submitting to the word and as they are submitting to the congregation, who is ultimately the ones who are governing. You can look at 2 Timothy and Titus in particular, to find the characteristics of who these elders or pastors are. You have these long lists of what, who these people are. And they have to be uh, men of high character. They have to be able to teach. They have to manage their households well. I mean, there's a good sense of We don't just throw anyone into the leadership in a church. Well, you give a lot of money to the church, you should be leading their church. That's not a good idea. And it, and it runs amok all the time. And some of you have seen these experiences before. Well, they lead in business. They should be leading in the church. Not necessarily so. They're not mature in their Christianity. The people that we want leading our church are those who fit the, the Timothy and Titus characteristics of what a leader is in a church. Uh, ultimately, if you want to know what that looks like, they become the ones that look like Jesus Christ to us. When we really can't see what, what it is to imitate Christ is what we're called to, we can, we can look to the leaders of our church and say, like, okay, they are examples of imitating Jesus Christ. That's why they have to be men of high character. And we don't just put anyone there. 
because it seems pragmatically reasonable to put this person in this, in this place. If they don't know Jesus Christ and are living out their lives at a high level of mature Christianity, we don't want to put them in this role because they're not going to lead well. But a, but a true leader, pastor and elder of a church is one who understands that they are following after Jesus. He is their king. And day in, day out, they're going to lead the church and shepherd the congregation to look more and more like Jesus Christ. Finally, we're served by deacons. There's a fourth one here. Ruled by Jesus, governed by the congregation, led by pastors and elders, served by deacons. Now this is important here. You can look at Acts chapter 6. As I mentioned this earlier, what you have is that you have the, the leaders of the church that don't have time to teach which is important. We need to be taught. They don't have time to teach the word of God to the people so they can grow in their faith because they're trying to distribute needs, especially to these widows that are there at the church. And so what they do is let's set aside some people, deacons, that can help us in this task so that we can focus on the word of God and that their needs can be met. And that's what deacons are. They're servants. And they're, they're here to serve. Some churches you've been a part of, these deacons have been pushed into a board and they've made decisions for the church. But that's not a role that the Bible has given to deacons. That's a role that the Bible has given to the whole church and to pastors and elders. So we need to rightly think about who deacons are. We don't want to not have deacons because deacons are an office of the church that are for our good. We need to have servants in the church that are helping us uh, in the way in which that we're moving forward to take the gospel to the uttermost. So that's who deacons are. The reason why we're talking through this is because no doubt, if you have an experience somewhat like mine, there's been confusion over proper church governance in the churches you've been a part of. We want a healthy church here at First Mansfield, which means that we have to have a, a healthy structure that supports the things that we're doing. We can have great ideas about reaching the community and reaching the lost and, 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 and all these great things that we can do for Jesus Christ. But if we don't have a structure that can support that, we're not going to be able to do anything. It's like getting a, a car that you have, that you have spent all kinds of money on the paint job, uh, on the interior, that you have the finest leather seats and the best sound system. Uh, and, and yet you have not spent any money on wheels. You're not going anywhere in that car. You have to have the full structure in place for it to do what it needs to do. And we need to have a proper biblical governance so that we can do all these wonderful things that God has called us to do. Listen, I'm excited about where we're going as First Mansfield, where we're headed. But we have to make sure that our governance is biblical. It is strong. And so what that means is that these four things, that we are ruled by Jesus, we are governed by the congregation, we're led by pastors and elders, and we're served by deacons, are put in their proper order. Ultimately, this means that all of us need to submit to the authorities that God has given to us. Some of you have not submitted to Jesus. I, I started this sermon this way. I'm going to fin finish this way. If you don't know Jesus, you need to submit to him. He is the authority of your life, whether you recognize it or not. Right. At some point, there will be a separation of the sheep from the goats. And that authority will say, those who are with me will come with me. Those who are not with me, I will say, depart from me. I do not know you. You don't want to be a part of that number. He is saying, come to me today. My yoke is easy. So if you haven't submitted to the rule of Jesus Christ, you need to do that today. But others of you haven't really understood what it means to be a member of the church in the way in which that we, we practice congregational governance. So as you ponder this type of structure, you have to ask yourself, how am I really involved in my church? Yes, we've asked you to be part of a life group. I go to that. Yes, you've been serving, and we want you to do that. But, but more than that, as we are a body of Christ, it's saying, how am I exercising my gifts? How am I being a part of the church when it gathers together to make decisions about what members come in, about what budget that we put forward, about what leadership that we put in place? And it's imperative that all of us who are members of this church are involved in that process. That we are listening to one another in love and trust of one another. That we're, This is not a power struggle we're aiming at because we're all submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
but we're functioning together as a congregation towards that end. So my call to you is to be responsibly involved in the church that you're a member of. Trust me, we want that. We need that more than we want it, though, because this is the way the Bible has brought this together. If we are the body of Christ, if we are the people of God, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which the Bible speaks about those things, we are the bride of Christ, then we who are church members come together to do that work together to complete the great commission to make disciples of everyone. So you are a part of that as part of a congregation. I hope some way, somehow, th this type of message comes into your heart about what it is that you're doing. Personally, your Christianity, where you're at, but with us as a church, because it's not individuals that God has called to take the gospel to the uttermost. He's called the church to do it. And he's equipped the church with a variety of giftings to come together to fulfill the Great Commission. How are you doing that? How are you doing that in the way you are part of this church as we make decisions? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of the early church. We want to follow you and your rule and leadership in our church in all ways. So forgive us where we don't seek after you in the decisions that we make here. And by your spirit and through other church members, help us as First Baptist Mansfield be the place that functions well so that we can take the gospel to the uttermost. Father, where we have not followed the, the ruling of Jesus, help us submit whether that's to come to faith for the first time or those of us who are just kicking against authority constantly, may we repent of our hard-heartedness to submit to the authorities you've given us. Father, as we are members of this church, may you, by your spirit and your word, encourage us to become members that are involved in the decisions that are being made, that we joyfully want to gather together, that we want to voice our opinions and work together so that we can do more for this community, more for your kingdom. So draw us closer together in love and trust for the gospel. Father, if we have trouble submitting to the leaders that you brought to this church, work on our hearts so that we can submit to them because you have given them authority over us. trust in that leadership. May we pray for these leaders as they care for our souls, as they teach us your word. And Father, for the, for the deacons you've called out in this church who are also examples to us all of mature Christians who are serving, may you call out more deacons. And may we, those who are deacons, serve with gladness help the structure of your church do what it needs to do 